Let's take a closer look at this thing function. So uh, this y function that we have here. So um, we have basically now the, plotted it here for you as a function of the detuning and here the transition probability. So just now this uh, y function for this rectangular pulse. And you can see actually there's only a narrow window of frequencies where we can actually make a significant transition probability. There are actually zero crossings here and zero crossings here at kind of frequencies 2 pi over capital T, the pulse length detunings, and minus 2 pi over T, capital T. So only within this window here from minus 2 pi over t to 2 pi over t is our transition probability kind of significant. Um, there are some side lobes here, of course, but the dominant amount of transition probability happens within that window. So that means we can have transitions for, let's write this down, transitions for delta omega smaller than 2 pi over t. Right? for detunings or magnitudes of the detuning smaller than 2 pi over t, which means then that delta omega times t should be rate or equal than 2 pi. If I multiply this by h bar, I get um, delta e times t larger or equal than h. And this is what we call a time frequency uncertainty relation. And that's very important. It always comes out when you're doing Fourier transforms. Sorry for that. Time frequency uncertainty relationship. And this tells us that, you know, our mismatch in energy of the light field compared to the atomic transition frequency uh, can only be within a window of 2 pi over t such that we can basically make significant transition probability. So the longer our pulses are, the narrower this window of energies are that we're allowed to have to make a transition. So the more precisely we have to tune our laser light frequency to the frequencies of the atomic transition. And uh, so if you, for example, want to precisely determine uh, kind of where this transition happens, at what frequencies happens, you better take long pulses where this basically becomes very, very narrow. And there's, of course, no surprise to see this here, and it's simply a fact of the spectral content of your light field pulse. So if you think about an oscillating light field here, and uh, you have a rectangular pulse, and you think about what is the spectral content of such a light field, oscillating light field. Well, that's not just going to be the frequency here, because you're turning it on only over a finite time, you're basically going to have a certain bandwidth of frequencies. And the shorter this pulse is, the larger this bandwidth of frequencies is that we are supplying to the atom. So only in the limit of a very, very infinitely long pulse can we think of this wave as precisely one, exactly one frequency that we're sending onto the atom, interacting with the atom. And then we have to match this frequency, of course, exactly to the atomic transition frequency to make a transition. All right, let's look at this function, what happens as a function of pulse length then here. So let's look at the case where kind of our pulse length would increase here. Uh, this is our detuning. And you can indeed see what I told you on those last slides. So that as the pulse length gets longer and longer, the transition probability grows stronger and stronger, actually grows quadratically in the pulse length initially. And uh, the frequency range over which we can make the transition, you can see here, this becomes narrower and narrower as the pulse length increases. So we have a narrow, narrow window of frequencies over which we can make the transition. And this is basically, again, just a fact of the spectral content of the finite time kind of oscillating field we're supplying to the atoms. All right, so in the limit, when we take capital T to infinity, in the limit of an infinitely long light pulse, actually one can show that this y function, this sinc function, kind of turns into a delta function. And that's what we turns mathematically, what we just said with words. Then you only have transition probability for capital T, the pulse length going to infinity, if you precisely match uh, 
the resonance frequency of the atom to the uh, transition frequency. So remember, omega, delta omega is omega minus omega k1, and only if uh, delta omega is zero are you going to be able to drive a transition in this limit of capital T going to infinity. And again, being the fact that infinitely long light pulse has a, only one frequency that we're supplying to the atoms. So the atom, this frequency better match the atomic transition frequency, or if it doesn't, we cannot make a transition. All right, finally, for this lecture, let's look at the kind of case where we not only have a single state, single final state, but we, we have a dense kind of set of final states very close uh, by within each other. So this is what we call a quasi-continuum of states. And uh, so if you think of it now, how best to describe such a quasi-continuum, one thing we want to know, how many states are there actually within an energy interval delta E? So let's count the number of states delta N uh, that are, so that's the number of states in an energy interval delta E around energy, final energy EK. And the energy width of the window is delta E. And now if we take the limit of delta E going to zero, then of course what we get, d n d e, the derivative, and this has a name, this is the so-called density of states of the system. How many states are available to the system at an energy E within an infinitesimal energy width d E. So now under such conditions, we can actually also derive the transition probability. And I don't want to do the calculation here. You can look it up in several textbooks. But I just want to give you the results because it's very similar to what we had derived before for the state, where, for the case where we only have one final state available to the system. So again, we see that the transition probability increases linearly over time, just as in the case that we had derived before for t going to infinity, capital T going to infinity. And we see now that the transition rate, if we take the time derivative, so gamma k1 is the, what we call the transition rate. How many transitions do we make per second? And that's just the time derivative of our system, of our transition probabilities. And uh, this gives us this gamma k1. And you see that this transition rate, this is proportional to this matrix element squared. So again, this is something that tells us about the coupling strength between state 1 and state k. And this coupling strength, actually let's think about it in our case of the light atom interaction DE Hamiltonian. This includes the dipole matrix element, but it also includes the electric field. Uh, of our system. So the amplitude of the electric field goes in here as E0 squared. And E0 squared, remember from your course on electromagnetism, this is proportional to the intensity of the light field. So this transition rate is actually going to increase with increasing intensity uh, that you apply to the system. And that's of course something very natural that you think of that's very intuitive. You shine your light onto the atom you make your laser more and more intense and the more and more transition you're going to have. And this is just directly proportional in this regime of perturbation theory. The second factor that we have here, the second factor that we have here, this is just the so-called density of states evaluated at this final energy E1 plus h bar omega. So E1 is the initial state, that's the energy of the light field that we're supplying. If that matches the final energy, then we just have to evaluate how many states are available to the system at this final energy. So this is basically the number of available states to the system. Available final states to the system. And all of this is a very famous equation. It's so-called Fermi's golden rule, which allows us to kind of estimate transition probabilities uh, 
and we shine light onto an atom and you want to get a first idea of kind of what is the rate of transition I'm going to have when going from one state one, let's say the ground state, to some state k. And you see it always boils down to the matrix element squared and the density of states. So with that we've arrived at the conclusion of our kind of perturbative treatment of the light atom interaction and uh, in the next class we actually want to turn to exact solutions for the case of a two-level system where we don't have to make any approximations. Thanks and see you in the next class.